Welcome. Uh, my name is Bill Martin. I'm managing director with Lovelytics in charge of our manufacturing, retail, CPG, logistics, and distribution industry verticals. Um, we're here to talk about how generative AI and AI in general is going to revolutionize manufacturing and retail. And I want to, before we get to the agenda, I want to lean back a little bit and talk about some taglines that have been present in the industry um, for the last decade, maybe two decades. Um, you know, every company is a technology company. So that was maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you, st you heard that. Every company needs to be a technology company to be successful. And then about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you started to hear every company needs to be a data company. If you're not a data company, you're not gonna succeed, you're gonna be left in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the rear view mirror um, you know, without any hope of succeeding. And so when we talk about generative AI and AI in general, we're talking about a solution that's really the culmination of technology and data. So the companies that have prepared their data, the companies that have technology in place, the companies that have quality, quality data that is available for these types of solutions are gonna be the companies that are gonna lead the way. Um, and this is truly a revolutionary moment. I mean, you can make an argument that generative, generative AI and its impact on manufacturing and retail is gonna be as fundamental as electricity was, as fundamental as the internal combustion engine was, as fundamental as the desktop computer was, as fundamental as the internet was. And it's gonna be the culmination of all of these things. Um, it's truly going to be the technology that's going to drive efficiencies. It's truly gonna be the technology that's gonna drive increased revenue opportunities. It's truly gonna be the technology that's going to drive increased profitability and efficiency across organizations. And so the organizations that you are a part of, if you're not currently out there thinking about how you can adopt generative AI solutions for your organization, your organization is falling behind. Um, your competitors are doing it. And we see it every day. We do lots and lots and lots of generative AI work. Um, we're going to later on today, or later on this afternoon, um, my colleague, I'm gonna let him introduce himself here in a second, is going to um, be doing a demo of a very cool solution for product onboarding, which is a very key concept to both manufacturing and retail, probably more key to the retail side than it is to the manufacturing side, but product onboarding and the dynamic nature of the market today and the demands of the consumer are impacting an organization's ability, a retailer's ability to get products to market and get them to market in the right mix. And that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit today as well. So as we go through, our agenda today, we're gonna to talk about some common market drivers, the problems that Gen AI is solving in these uh, areas, and what some of the challenges are. We're gonna go through some specific manufacturing and retail AI use cases. We're gonna talk about the challenges, because you can never forget um, what the challenges are, uh, because if you don't understand where your headwinds are, you're not gonna be able to uh, navigate your course appropriately. Um, and then we're gonna get into a couple case studies, and then finally, um, and I'm gonna allow him to introduce himself here right now. Um, my colleague, uh, Sadir Ghazri, is going to talk about our Lovelytics six-step uh, generative AI framework, which is critical to developing any sort of a generative AI solution. Um, that framework is extremely important. He'll go over that. And then we're gonna go over this really very, very, very cool, I think you're gonna be very impressed, um, product onboarding uh, uh, solution that he's gonna demo for us. So do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, well, good afternoon and uh, thank you everyone for being here. You know, as they say when you board a Southwest flight, we realize you had a choice of options and thank you for choosing Southwest. So we realize you have a choice of, uh, choice of different sessions and thank you for choosing this one. Uh, my name is Sudhir. I head up the uh, Gen AI and AI practice for uh, Lovelytics. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about some cool stuff. Uh, we are actually going to show you some stuff. So, no, it's not just slideware. It's some uh, demo stuff as well. Yep. Awesome. So, a little bit about my background before I get into these, uh, this, these first few slides. So, um, I've been in consulting since 2020. I decided to make the change at the height of COVID, which is interesting 
timing for me wanting to make that change. A number of factors uh, were, were in effect there. But anyway, so I made the change. Before that, I was in the Fortune 500 space for a long time. Um, I was with an organization that was a manufacturer, a distributor, a logistics company, and some would argue even a retailer. So I have experience across all of these different verticals. Um, I was chief data officer of that organization for about the last four years of my career with them. Prior to that, I ran North American supply chain for that organization, so I'm very, very aware of how complex supply chain, especially global supply chain, can be, and especially post-COVID global supply chain has become even more challenging. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about the common market drivers and some of the problems that they solve and some of the challenges um, that uh, you need to be aware of when you're talking about these. And this is, this is a laundry list. This is, there's so many potential AI use cases out there, and there's so many potential AI talking points out there that trying to document them all in a session like this is just really not even possible. So what I want to try to do is I just want to try to set the stage for his demo and an understanding of the framework that you need to adopt in order to be successful with these types of solutions. So we're going to go over at a very high level. So first, when you talk about market drivers, problems solved, and challenges, one of the big top of mind thing, things for all retailers, and really I'll get into in a second, I make the case that Manufacturing and retail are the same business because some manufacturers are truly manufacturers, but they have customers just like retailers do. Some retailers carry their supply chain all the way from manufacturing, manufacture their own goods, and take them all the way to the consumer. And then you have everything in between. So there's the commonality across these two industries and across all the businesses that are involved in these two industries is really remarkable. And I want to focus on that today. And in fact, the product, the product onboarding demo that we're going to do later today really, I think, sort of gives a clear understanding of how a single Gen AI solution and a single generative AI concept and business use case can really up be applied across all of these different verticals within this industry, all the different business types. Um, and so as you determine where you're going to invest your dollars, there's a common set of use cases that I think are going to rise to the forefront and really be where that investment is going to occur because they're common to both manufacturing and retail. And so you're going to have investment coming from major players in both areas that are going to be, that are going to be developing really, really capable solutions in these places. So talk about personalization and, mark and recommendations. So this is top of mind for every retailer. Like how do we get closer to the customer? Every single retailer that I've ever talked to, that I've ever, ever engaged with says, I want to use my data, I want to build generative AI to understand my customer better. And I'm not a technician, I'm a business person first, so I'm just dangerous enough to talk about technology, which I know if I, if I talk to, to Sadir, he's very, very, very technical and he's very capable of, of having that conversation. I want to talk about the business side of it, but customer expectations are rising like at a fever pace. The expectations of every generation that gets into multi-channel retail are rising. The competition is fierce. And so investing here obviously makes very much, makes a lot of sense. It's just you have to make sure that you understand where to invest your money. And that's gonna be different for all of your organizations. The concepts are the same at a high level, but that's gonna be a different point. What do you want to achieve from, from your customers, what are the expectations of how you're gonna get your customers to interact in a more um, engaging way, in a more active way with your brand, with your products, with your interfaces, and ultimately grow that business with them and build loyalty um, and trust with that customer. So that's top of mind for everybody. Um, what, pro what problem does that solve? So obviously, low engagement rates are a problem for a lot of different retailers in multi-channel. Um, it brings up those engagement rates, right? And that's obviously positive for revenues, positive for profits, positive in a lot of different areas. Um, it decreases your churn. So builds loyalty, builds trust, brings them back to you, enables you to market to them in a completely different way because they trust you. It's a much different marketing process when you mar try to market to someone who doesn't trust you versus someone who does trust you. Um, you, can, you can market to them in completely different ways. And obviously it helps with your customer loyalty program. Um, and that's something that post-COVID, we saw this big increase in spend 
um, across um, the, our consumers because it was fueled by free money that was put into the system to rescue the country from COVID. So that's starting to back off. Inflation is starting to rise. And you're starting to see customers be more choosy about where they're spending their money. Um, you're starting to see the, the spend levels go down. So you're starting to see the need for loyalty to grow. So you're starting to see an increase focus from retailers on their loyalty programs and enhancing those loyalty programs. And then some of the challenges, um, obviously data privacy is always a challenge when you're dealing with customer data, um, and then integration with, with existing systems, which frankly across all Gen AI solutions, that's always gonna be a problem is integrating your systems um, that, are, that are living downstream from the, or upstream from these solutions. Uh, sorry, I skipped over inventory management. So inventory management, demand forecasting. Demand forecasting, and these are both very close to my heart. When I ran supply chain uh, for the organization I was a part of, these were two processes that were absolutely necessary. The, the business I was a part of, even though it was a very large business from a volume standpoint, we were not a very profitable business. So a good year for us was two and a half to 3% net margin. So when you're dealing with margins that slim, you really need to be cognizant of your demand planning and your inventory. And if you're carrying you know, $10 million too much inventory, and you can reduce that, you can reduce the carrying cost associated with that inventory, you're going to significantly impact that margin. You could potentially impact it by a point, half a point. That's a big deal when you're talking about low margins like that. Um, so again, supply chain optimization, cost reduction, constantly changing customer tastes and preferences. That's what I was talking about before. They are constantly changing. I mean, I will use quick serve restaurants as an example. How many times do you see flavors change at a quick serve restaurant? How many burgers can you introduce in like a six month time period that are all different flavors? It's insane. Everybody's trying to one up each other. Dairy Queen has 10 new flavors of ice cream every quarter. How do they manage that? Their product development, their R&D is way ahead of the curve. And they're using generative AI solutions to determine what the market wants. They're using machine learning, they're using generative AI solutions to determine what the market wants and to predict it before it actually even happens. And that's based on using generative AI to look at the market in general, to look at what the competitors are doing from large to small, to look at all of that data that's out in the market and monitor those tastes and those trends. Like I watched something the other day that like this summer is like the summer of tajin. Like what does that even mean? Like, the summer of tahine, like how did tahine become, get a, get a season? I mean, I don't, I don't really understand that, but somehow the market data indicated that tahine is open to partnerships and they want to flavor everything in the market right now. So just be cognizant as you design these things that nimbleness is really, really, really critical. And then obviously overstock and stockouts, you want to maintain your custom levels of customer service as much as possible. And through that process, um, you know, you can't absorb stockouts, you can't have inefficient supply chains. You need, to man you need to manage that well in order to make sure that you have the right products for your customers when they want them, where they want them, in the style that they want, in the flavor that they want, whatever that is, it's super important. And then again, challenges, data accuracy, adapting to market fluctuations and, of course, global uncertainty, which um, is paramount when you're managing global supply chain, which is what I was a part of. And then I won't stay on this one too long. I've already kind of talked about it with the, uh, the restaurant flavors and the quick serve restaurant flavors, but product design and development. So you can use generative, generative AI to understand the market in a deeper way, understand your customers in a deeper way, understand what they're asking for, understand um, lots of different metrics and then combine those metrics into something that's gonna help you to develop products that are more applicable, applicable to, your, uh, to your market and are going to drive um, more uh, customer satisfaction and of course higher revenues and uh, loyalty and higher profit margins. And then uh, challenges, ensuring market fit. So there's a lot of this out there. You know, product testing happens quite a bit. So I know that none of you are probably, or most of you are probably not involved directly in product development. Um, but as you develop prod new products, obviously there's a 
very robust process that has to happen to make sure that that product's gonna be a good fit. But again, generative AI can speed up the ideation process for the, those new products, which you can then apply your testing process to that and try to, and that in, inherently speeds up the, the, spe the uh, ability to get those to market quicker. Um, and then intellectual property management, obviously that's top of mind as well as just like data security, um, data privacy laws around the customer. And then customer service and support. So this is a big one. I, I am a huge believer, now that we've see, started to see a move back to brick and mortar shopping. So brick and mortar shopping has undergone a bit of a revival, especially with certain luxury brands. Um, you look at sort of niche luxury brands, you're starting to see that revival. You're st I worked with a very large men's, no, no advertisement, men's clothing retailer um, last year, and I would not be wearing any of their clothes right now, but maybe I am, um, that was about a year-long engagement of mine, and they were extremely, extremely um, focused on making their salespeople as effective as possible. That's all I can say. So sales associate, they wanted them on day one to know everything about every item in the store, to be able to pair items together, to create you know, very fashionable outfits for people and be able to understand. They had very, very high expectations. And one of the ways you can do that is augment their ability, their knowledge. So augment their ability to train quickly, augment their ability to have knowledge in the store, to have product knowledge. So basically augment your sales, your sales associates using AI-based solutions to understand how they can better interact with your customers. Um, and that can be applied obviously to online as well. It's more of a, an on-prem use case, but um, digital can uh, apply that as well. All right. So let's go through some use cases. And I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna do this pretty quick. I'm not going back, there we go. So again, when I talked earlier about retail and manufacturing, I talked about the common use cases. So this is a laundry list of use cases. Um, you've, heard, you've heard of most of these. I'm sure in your businesses you can think of you know, 20 others that are applicable to your business. But there are common use cases across distribution, supply chain, logistics, vendor and product onboarding, demand planning and forecasting, and I don't know what the last one is, pricing. <laughs> I can't see it over my subtitles. Um, so these are areas that are very common to both manufacturing and retail, drive a lot of value for both manufacturing and retail. So these are the areas that I think is where all the money's gonna be spent. I think the vast majority of the Gen AI money and the experimenting that's gonna be done and the testing that's gonna be done in these early phases of Gen AI adoption is gonna be done in these areas. I really do. And so as you go back and you talk to your business leaders and you talk about budgeting for Gen AI pilots and Gen AI MVPs and Gen AI POVs, I think this, these are the use cases that need to be top of mind. You need to be talking to supply chain folks. You need to be talking to your marketing folks. You need to be talking um, to your pricing folks. Because you know, one concept of dynamic pricing, of understanding the market holistically to understand where you can charge X, where you can charge Y, where you can charge Z, and how you can do that dynamically across your ecosystem to be able to put the optimal price in front of your customer every time they engage with you. That's really, really critical. So this next slide is where I think the convergence of manufacturing and retail happens. So this is a supply chain. And those bullets, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but those bullets are basically questions that people that exist along the supply chain might ask. And they're in plain English, they're not in industry standard terms, they're not in anything that's, that's hard for anybody to understand. But when I talk about this slide, I think about this is retail on the right. That's a household, right? So that's the end consumer. Manufacturing is on the far left. So manufacturing actually is the same as retail. It just stops before it hits, in most cases, it stops before it hits the household. It's the same problem set. You still are making things, you're still distributing things, you're still selling things, you're still trying to please your customers, you're still having to deal with the supply chain, you're still having to deal with all of the complexity that comes with that. It just sits in a different spot in the ecosystem. So don't think that they're different. There might be some subtle differences, there might be use cases out there that are unique 
to these because marketing for a manufacturer is fundamentally different than it is for a retailer, but not always. How about marketing for the automotive industry? Is that any different than marketing for retail? Not really, because marketing for the automotive industry, most of which is created at the auto manufacturer level and pushed to the public by the auto manufacturers is very similar to what retailers like Walmart and Target and others produce. You might have a dealership locally that's also pushing media out and marketing information out, but that's a completely different subset of marketing data around those automobiles and those trucks. So it's really not any different. All the use cases are the same. It's just the pieces and parts. It's what they're selling, it's how they're selling it, are they going through distribution or are they going to the end user directly? So just as you think through this, just understand that there is a lot of commonality here. Come on. I'll just do this. Hold on. There we go. Okay, challenges. I'm not gonna go through this. You guys know this. You, most of you are technicians. Most of you live this day in and day out. Um, security and privacy, integration of legacy systems, very, very hard problems to solve, uh, very unique for most organizations. Um, skills and workforce development, um, that's top of mind. I think as we go into productionalized AI and gen AI um, uh, systems, you're gonna have to upskill workforce. Workforce is going to need to understand how to maintain those in a production environment, and that's not a skill that's readily out there. So just be, just be cognizant of that. Initial investment costs, so I've seen this firsthand. Some clients, we go through a POC, and you know the POC is funded by Databricks, and so there's no skin in the game for them. They like the outcome of the POC, and then we have a discussion about what, what it's gonna cost to productionalize, and they're shocked. So. Don't, don't fall victim to that, that mindset and understand that the implementation costs for these are not gonna be insignificant, but hopefully you have a great partner like Databricks that's gonna be able to help you to make that investment. Um, standardization and interoperability, um, ensuring seamless communication um, between different systems and different devices is obviously crucial. This again, I'll go back to the sales associate um, uh, uh, use case. That's complex. So you might have wearables, you might have, you might have iPads, you might have different types of, of information that they go through in, with, that's embedded in your ERP system. Um, there's all kinds of different interfaces that need to be coordinated for that, and then obviously governance. And then we're gonna go through these use cases, and Sadir is going to um, help me with this. Um, so the first one, this is the use case that is the basis of the demo that he's going to give. So a global Fortune 500 distributor um, managing millions and millions of products um, had a tremendous issue with being able to bring new products into their ecosystem and sell them to their customers. Literally hundreds of products a day were needed and it would take three months you know, four months maybe to get a product into their system so they would have to tell their customers, we can get it for you, but we can't get it for you until we get it set up on our system. We can't get it for you until we procure it. All these different steps. So how do we speed that up? Well, he's gonna explain to you exactly how we speed that up. Um, so there's a technical design. I don't know if you wanna say anything about the technical piece in the middle? Yeah, definitely. So, and I'll I have an architecture diagram over with, uh, to go with this as well, right? So, the, you know, what we believe at Lovelytics, right? Tapping into the different components of the Databricks architecture, your Databricks investments you already have, plus any other system, ERP, and kind of bringing that together into sort of like a unified architecture to come up with a solution. So that is, in short, kind of the story over here. And it's a pretty interesting architecture we chose because there's a combination of custom machine learning and there's a combination of generative AI, specifically LLMs, right? Along with that, there's like an integration with third-party data, some uh, you know, 2.6 million products, including 2.3 un unmapped products. It's a story of structured data, unstructured data, and obviously all the usual suspects that we use to make everything come together from a Databricks infra perspective, you know, Databricks vector search, foundations model API to call different models, uh, rack pipelines, prompt templates, um, obviously um, uh, rack chain, which is a you know, pretty cool and uh, very useful tool. And then uh, we built a nice custom uh, UI, which you will see in my demo here shortly. 
And then most important, we put a custom um, ML ops and LLM, LLM ops framework. And then soon in the next stage, we'll be um, fully embracing the lake house monitoring uh, as well. So I'll, I'll go through that architecture in more okay. detail. And I'm gonna get through these quickly so you yes. can get to yours. Yeah, go ahead, so um, again, business value for this client um, was very obvious. Um, quicker time to market led to increased revenue, led to less customer churn, led to less competition, um, led to increased profitability, um, increased customer trust, increased loyalty, all of the above. So this solution that he's gonna demo solved a big part of that problem for them. It enabled, literally turned their onboarding process from, like I said, a 60 to 90 day process into a process that is a few minutes. So literally revolutionary. And if you want to spend some time on your architecture slide? Yes, so, okay, so again, as Bill was, by the way, uh, thank you. I think yeah. that was a really good sort of kind of grounding I'll on the challenges that. in um, retail as well as manufacturing and some of the opportunities that we may have through AI and generative AI. So I call this, and there are various kind of thought processes and terminologies out in the market, but I call this as an ensemble architecture. Right, so what we have done over here is we have kind of split the product onboarding, the product description generation into two different sort of kind of components, or two different architectures, and then we bring both those architectures together, right? So if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, which is product onboarding, we have used a classic machine learning model, some flavor of um, SVM, SGMs, stuff like that, to kind of help with the product classification and categorization. Now, there is a debate, potentially could we have used some sort of LLM, maybe an LLM with some sort of you know, continuous pre-training followed by fine tuning to do that part as well? And the answer is possibly, right? But when you build architectures together, you have to think about you know, inferencing cost, token cost, GPUs for training and you know, all that type of stuff. So we believe we came up with an efficient and optimized architecture. It's kind of almost like using the right tool uh, for the right job, right? So the left-hand side, the product onboarding is classic machine learning, right? Taking a bunch of uh, training data, training the model, going through the train, train test cycle, validation cycle, getting it to a high level of accuracy, and that's how product onboarding happens. It's essentially a classification and a categorization problem if you kind of look at it from that perspective. Once that happens, and I found it hard to believe when I, when I heard about the problem, generating product descriptions is a huge problem in itself because there are multiple systems you, had to, you have to feed. And imagine if you have like millions of products, this client of ours literally had millions of, pro of products. Generating a accurate description, actually you can get sued if your description is not correct or you know, customers can be very unhappy, is a very hard problem. What a fantastic use case for using generative AI. Right? So the product description part um, is all generative AI based, which you will, you will see in my demo. I think we used uh, some sort of llama model for that. Uh, so we get all the attributes, uh, we pass it down to you know, Langchain, vector search, all that vector search, typical rack pattern gives us back some relevant pieces of information. Based on that, we go build product description. Now what happens is there is no such thing as a description. There are multiple descriptions for multiple downstore uh, uh, downstream systems. Uh, one of the systems needed actually a JSON representation. So now, converting that into JSON. Well, converting that into French, Spanish, German, whatnot, since this was an international company. So it was multiple problems that we solved very elegantly. And I will probably jump to my demo over here real quick, but let me just touch on this, another interesting case study since Bill talked about uh, manufacturing as well as retail. This is a retail case study, and I'll, the problem statement in this case study is as follows. You're shopping for a sweater for your grandma because it's her birthday or Christmas or whatever. And that is, or for your mother or for your sister, right? That's a very hard thing to do because typically these people walk in a store, the customer walks in a store and says, my grandma likes usually like a blue or a green color, likes something loose fitting, and then with that, I like these different accessories. So we essentially take that English language description, we break it down into different types of attributes, and based on those attributes, we do a vector search, a rack pattern, and then call an LLM, and then figure out what exact products would match that criteria. Now, this is a real problem in retail, because if you're in a busy store on a Saturday afternoon or something, 
and somebody walks in with those kind of vague requirements, it takes anywhere from about 30 to 45 minutes to exactly find that product. And sometimes they don't even find it, but the product does exist. So it's a lot of loss of revenue and that type of stuff. So here is a pretty simplified architecture for that. On the left-hand side, I call it as language description decomposition, right? My grandma likes a blue sweater, which is loose, loose fitting, and along with that, these couple of accessories. So that's your language description. Using a combination of LLMs and the usual suspect in there, I think we use DBRX uh, for this particular one. You can then break it down by simple and clever prompt engineering into different entities, attributes, product specs, potentially even size and color. So now you have gathered a lot of intelligence then we pass it to our search system. Again, a classic ensemble architecture. And uh, you know, the search system taps into the inventory, pulls up the right information, and then we have a nice looking UI to kind of show that. All right, so with that, let's switch to a demo real quick over here. And we were having some problems with the mouse. Um, you know, when they interview at Loveletics, they did not ask me a question about my mouse skills, so that is very fortunate. My boss is right in the room, so I better control my jokes here. But uh, okay, so having said that, um, this is the Gen AI powered multi-system product descriptions, right? I mean, as I said earlier, it's a big problem. So let's just say I'm a business analyst or I'm a product analyst and I'm a manufacturer and I'm dealing with uh, dishwashers. So let's just say I put in something very vague. Give me a detailed description of Whirlpool, blah, 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 dishwasher, including specifications and finish, and... Can't see it. Wow, interesting. Something, something didn't switch. Um, Is it up on your screen? Oh man, you missed like most of my demo, I guess. Is there a switch I need to... You know, maybe, do I need to get out of my presentation, I suppose? Maybe drag it to the main, so go back to your... Oh, go back to my demo, okay. And then do something like this. Yes, is that what you did? No. Okay, it's coming over here, so maybe over here. There we go. Okay. That'll work. All right, not the red X, that one. All right, All perfect. Right. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay. This is gonna be interesting. Okay, so I am a product analyst and I say wanna generate a description for this Whirlpool. So the first thing I do is I do show attributes because the description has to be generated with some ground truth, some reality, and this is now tapping, going through an LLM, decomposing, and then tapping into your ERP systems and pulling up all the relevant attributes, okay? Now me as a business analyst is gonna say, okay, I'm interested in this, this, and this, and I want my description to be done in two different categories, the product description and the warranty. So I go hit the generate description button, and then behind the scenes, a lot of magic happens, right? So basically, we're taking all of those attributes, we're taking that high-level English language statement over there, we're taking um, uh, the, the, the categories, make an LLM call, and a beautiful description comes up, right? Now, look at the formatting of this description. Vendor information, product details, product information, features, specifications, warranty, all that type of stuff. Now, of course, a question that comes up, I'm sure some of you are thinking in the room, how do you know it's not hallucinating? How do you know this is all accurate, right? So there's two techniques we use for that. One is obviously a rag pattern. So we are actually providing it with the ground truth or with the data regarding the product. And we are basically saying, hey, stay within these swim lanes and please generate a description based on this, this, and this, right? Now, of course, having said that, there's no guarantee. So you have to go through an elaborate eval process, testing, and you know all that type of stuff. So you have to put your guardrails in place. So a beautiful description came up over here. What you saw happen in minute, actually in seconds, this used to be weeks long process for them to get the accuracy right and all that. So this is a huge uh, performance optimizer right over there, right? Problem number two is it's not like they're done. Now they have to generate it in different formats. So I clicked on the SAP description. In this case, SAP needed JSON. So it simply took that and then came up with a beautiful JSON description of what you just saw. 
Of course, you have given some cool little bells and whistles over here, like you can do a copy and uh, you know, paste and all that type of stuff. Now what happens is for basic mere mortals and humans to read, they needed a web promo description, which is like, you know, um, something like a Twitter feed or something like that, right? With a limited number of characters to put on a website or put as a caption. So this then compresses the description down to like maybe three or four meaningful sentences. So that is a, that's a, you know, example of a web promo description. Now again, sorry, I keep reiterating the point, to go from one description format to the other took them several hours, sometimes even days, with different people getting involved, different approvals, all that type of stuff. What we have simply done over here is we have done you know, chaining of LLMs. We, one LLM calls the other one, um, check the output, we give it some very clear prompting specifications saying you know, generate an output which is limited to this, this, and this, take the output from the previous LLM, that type of stuff, you know, typical lang chain type of stuff from an architecture perspective. All right, so you know, having said that, these days most companies are international, and then the question comes up of translation. Now, translation could be another big problem where they would do this and they would outsource it to people who spoke French, German, Spanish, whatever, and then there would be multiple iterations of going through a correct translation, which is accurate and all that. Over here, all I did is I just pressed a button, and then uh, right about now, I don't know if there's any Spanish-speaking speaking people in the room, but anyway, a Spanish um, translation came up, right? So obviously, similar thing with French, German, whatever you want. Adding a new language for these highly capable, you know, 70 billion parameter models or even higher is actually pretty easy. Uh, the translation is, you know, fairly good uh, when they tested it. They were pretty happy with the outcomes, all that type of stuff. So this is our basic demo over here. And this was the description generation demo, as again, to summarize, you know, ensemble architecture, classic machine learning, chaining together with LLMs, very, very powerful, compelling system. 30-day problem got reduced, reduced to a couple of hours or, um, or weeks. All right, um, since we have a couple of minutes more, I wanted to uh, talk about our framework, but I will not attempt switching slides. <laughs> uh, however, I'm giving another talk tomorrow at 11.40 where we talk about our Gen AI discovery framework, right? So the problem with Gen AI today is it's general purpose technology and not everybody knows where the use cases are. Most people think of it as language, summarization, text, uh, rack patterns, all, all of that. Beyond that, there are many high value use cases. So we have another demo yet tomorrow um, same time, same place. No, actually not same time, same place. It's at 11.40 in a, in a different room. Uh, but please come for that session as well. And, uh, you know, we'll be happy to take a few questions if you have any.